Cool. Hey, uh, so yesterday, Stuart, my colleague at SoundCloud, uh, gave a talk about Alert Manager and the life of an alert. And he said, like, someone should totally talk about how to do it in Slack. And I said, yeah, do it. Um, unfortunately, we had some beers and I lost. So now I give this, I'm giving this talk. So yeah, how to customize your Alert Manager notifications? actually not really hard. Um, and yeah, I guess the question most people have, like, how can I uh, receive nicer Slack notifications from Alert Manager? Um, the short answer to that is don't disable Slack and use uh, a ticketing system. You really don't want to use uh, Slack for that. Uh, it is not a 12 talk. I will talk about this a little bit more and how to actually do it, but to actually give you some impression or like idea of why you really sh should think about using a ticketing system instead. For one, uh, keep communication channels like Slack for humans and not spam them with like automatic uh, notifications because at some point no one will read your uh, channel anymore. Uh, it avoids alerting fatigue. We have like some people who receive constantly alerts in their channel and by now they just don't look anymore. Like when I ask them like, hey, have you ever looked in this warning? They're just like, yeah, I get so many of them, I don't look into them. So it really doesn't make sense to use Slack for that. Um, also, you should really consider fixing issues where you get alerts about, like in the same way you tweet any other work, like uh, have a ticket system, you assign, someone is assigned to them, someone takes care of it, you schedule them uh, in your next uh, sprint, uh, you can track time, your managers will be happy and so on. And um, yeah, also like if you get a notification or like an alert which is not really actionable, someone also tweet that as a ticket. Like then look into it, like why wasn't it actionable and like fix it or like remove the alert. And there is like an integration for alert manager uh, for Jira, given it's like so popular, so like you can look into that. So, if you really still want to use Slack, uh, you can write your own templates in uh, Alert Manager. You are not like bound to whatever is the default, um, which might or not, might not work for you. So, uh, what you need is you understand YAML. Uh, as I heard, that's really complicated. Uh, you also need to understand Go templating. It's also for some people, uh, I guess, like new and not that easy. Um, you. I guess it helps if you go Slack has like a message builder where you can like play around with like the format you want to have. There is an alert manager configuration that's also what you want to look or like have open to like know um, what, yeah, what options are available. And obviously you need permissions to actually change your alert manager config. Example, that's something we have at SoundCloud right now for our channel. Um, I guess it's a little bit more readable than, or like a lot more readable to some people uh, than the default one. Uh, so at SoundCloud, we have like always a summary and a description for an alert. Um, it also has a name, so that's what you see in, on the top. Uh, we group alerts and yeah, we remove most of the labels in that, um, in that view because we don't we just needed a notification and not like all the details. What you might find interesting, we have then like these nice buttons to like immediately go to the one book and dashboard um, or the source of the alert. How did we do this? So in alert manager, you only need like one thing, um, the templates part. Uh, so you want to load some templates from somewhere. And obviously here we want to like work on the Slack config. How does this particular Slack config look like? Um, so you can, change the title and the text and you can attach actions. So like actions are these buttons. So there you can see an example of like, we have in all our alerts, a one book URL um, annotation. You can then access that common annotation because it's like the same for all alerts and display it as a button. If that is empty, the button won't be displayed. So it's pretty convenient. Um, these fields are like these nicer, uh, the states and alert grouping, these are fields. So you can attach like different fields. In this case, I'm using a template, which I will show in a second. Uh, and yeah, we, as I said, we have like a common uh, description annotation, which is available or must be available. We enforce that in all our alerts. So uh, you can just use that as a text. Just to give you an example and the next, oops. So that's how like the template looks like. You can like define more complicated things, which would become too long to like put them into that alert manager uh, config directly. You can like define templates for that and then access them. So here, for example, we built like a little bit more complicated title um, out of the alert name and the summary of the alert. Uh, we use alert states. Um, you can then use like anything like from Go template available, like ranges, if statements, um, functions like the lang and build like a little bit more complicated um, templates. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. Afterwards, you end up with nice, uh, nicer notifications. Cool, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Sneha. And I'm Daisy. 
Uh, and we're here today to talk about baby steps to open source software contribution. Uh, this may or may not be an elephant in the room. Either way, someone yesterday asked about diversity. So we felt like as members of un un underrepresented groups, as you can tell probably, uh, figured it'd be interesting to address. So as a beginner, it can often be intimidating to begin contributing to open source software. Namely, you might be like, where do I begin? What if I'm ridiculed? What if I ask a dumb question? All common questions and concerns. Um, as an honest beginner, we, our talk will include a lot of anecdotal experiences, so please yeah. keep it moving. Yeah, speak into it. So uh, please don't start a heat storm. <laughs> uh, a little about myself, I'm a software engineer and I've been a long time uh, user of open source software. I've always liked the idea of being able to use it freely and to be able to study it. Despite that, the thought of actually contributing was very daunting to me. Hello. Is this working? Okay, great. Hi. Um, well, I am formerly an electrical engineer who randomly got into software engineering. I sadly was not a longtime user of uh, open source software in my youth. Um, it just kind of happened recently. Uh, some questions you might ask yourself when starting out is, where do I begin? How do I start contributing? Uh, the first step would be to discover projects or merely hearing about it. For me personally, I had joined a Go Learning meetup group and that was how I had first heard about Prometheus. Other ways of discovering projects might be to talk to your friends and colleagues or browse a website I just learned about yesterday called githubhelpwanted.com. Um, when vetting projects, you, you might wanna ask uh, some key questions such as is the project well-maintained? Is the community friendly and welcoming? Um, is, are there clear contributing guidelines? Is there a code of conduct? Uh, here are some examples of projects that me and Sneha have heard good things about and uh, have been interested in. And personally, I have found the community uh, of Prometheus to be very friendly and welcoming, and I've, I've appreciated their diversity inclusion initiatives. Step two, how to get involved. So, you know, typically it's a good idea to try to run the software, get it running, often try to break it. Here's an issue that I submitted after I added emojis to Grafana dashboard names, which I guess hasn't been fixed, unfortunately. I should probably submit a pull request too. Um, you can also read the documentation, and then frequently I find it helpful to reach out to contributors, just either on Twitter, other forms of social media, Slack groups, IRC. People are often very friendly. Uh, the third step would be to submit your first pull request. Um, a good place to start would be documentation um, because as a project grows larger and larger, the gap between users and developers grow bigger and documentation is very important. And then you might want to look up uh, issues that are tagged with Help Wanted. Here's an example of something that Mia and Sneha had done for Prometheus where we added a feature to Prom Tool. And, uh, and like, and you might, and you could check out a GitHub helpwanted.com where you could kind of filter for issues by language and GitHub labels. Yay! Um, but what can you do? You not meaning people of underrepresented groups, but perhaps more experienced contributors. You can be proactive, of course. I think before I even considered ever wanting to contribute to anything, um, someone reached out to me and asked if I was interested, which kind of got the ball rolling, got me thinking about it. Um, you can offer to review, perhaps offer to pair a program, also super helpful. Um, I think uh, Jonas had suggested that quite often it's very easy for people to fix uh, beginner-friendly issues fairly quickly, but often leaving them around so that actual beginners could do them is great. And as a company, Julius touched upon this yesterday, it can be time consuming to work on open source software. So as a company, you have the luxury of having employees work on open source software. A great way to get more underrepresented groups involved or pay people to mentor others. Um, the takeaways from our talk is that contributing to open source can be very hard and time consuming, but don't be afraid to ask for help, and if you are in a position to help, please do it. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> and um, oh, on a side note, Shameless plug. Um, I made a little zine about the basics of PromQL. I thought it would be a good way to like a pitch Prometheus to your company or onboard new people. So if you want one, you can just come to me after. <laughs>
Thank you. Even there. So I'll try to keep it short. It's only seven roles of uh, Ansible. So I am Pavel Krupa. I'm working as an OpenShift developer at Red Hat. But uh, what I am presenting right now, it's not Red Hat work. It started before I started working at Red Hat. So as we know, uh, Prometheus can be installed in various ways. For example, for in Kubernetes. So go to Dr. Frederick or someone else. Uh, we have a distro package. There was a guy from uh, Debian. And we can compile it from source and everywhere. But uh, I will focus on GitHub release binary, because that's the one I'm using uh, with Ansible. But there are some problems. Run it in like 100 nodes. You will have ones. Uh, and run with uh, Selinux and run with uh, systemd. Those are not, uh, not exactly contributed in, uh, in documentation. So uh, in previous company, we decided to have something like um, multi, multi uh, CPU deploy on uh, various, uh, uh, various nodes. And we wanted it, uh, it to have almost zero configuration deployment. It, we wanted it to be easy. We wanted to uh, have easy, ease of management of this. And some maybe uh, error checking and maybe a little increased uh, security for that. So how, how do we configure uh, Prometheus? We have YAML configuration file, and we have like uh, overs which can be included in that file, or so common line parameters. So with Ansible, we have like nothing, but this nothing with uh, Ansible role uh, translates to the one slide uh, to, my, to my left, so your right. And this is basically what is uh, rendered uh, when you are using Ansible Prometheus uh, role from Cloud Locemi. And if you want to extend it a little bit, we have the same scheme. To, the, to, your, uh, to my right, to your left, there is the Ansible one, which easily translates to, um, to Prometheus one. If you look at it, it's basically the same one-to-one -one with uh, some additions. So uh, as for CLI parameters, we just wrapped it into systemd file. So we have uh, like Ansible custom configuration uh, to the left, your right, so yeah, your left, sorry. <laughs> and uh, this was uh, translated to the service file, which also have uh, additional, f uh, additional security things like private temp, uh, private temp directory or no new privileges and everything like that. So we basically have a sandbox uh, with systemd without containers. And users sometimes have, uh, some, sometimes make errors. So Ansible can uh, have this nifty feature of validation. So we basically have a validation of a, of a file with prompt tool. Also, uh, at the beginning of the execution of a role, we are using pre-flight checks, which are embedded in role to prevent some uh, configuration mishaps sort of security. So automated checksumming for downloading the binary from, uh, from GitHub. Uh, we are using dedicated uh, system user for every binary. Uh, for example, node uh, exporter is also, uh, we are using capabilities for this. There is also support, uh, limited support for Selinux, and as I said, some sandboxing. And the, one most important um, part of it, it's like compatibility with DevSecIO project. If you, if you see, uh, it's one of the biggest uh, security related Ansible project there is. Those are actually right now uh, roles which I'm maintaining. So if someone wants to maintain something else, please come later or write me. And everything, uh, in this Ansible roles is tested with CI system based on Travis. I'm using also Molecule, Docker, and Tox, and it's tested on six platforms. And with uh, current Ansible version, the previous one, and sometimes uh, the, uh, even the two, two, two later. Okay, so this is the demo site. If you want to go, let's uh, please check it. Uh, basically, those roles were also used for a security audit, from what I gathered, for Prometheus. And if you don't want, if you want to use Ansible and want to see the output, please go and use ARA, Ansible Run Analysis. It's pretty good. Okay, thank you. Hi, hi everyone. 
Um, so I'm Thibaut, I'm working as SRE at Criteo, and today I will talk about uh, using Prometheus and Graphite as a remote storage. Um, so first, a little bit of uh, con context. So years later, um, no, years, years ago, um, at Twitter, we were using a single time series database that was Graphite, and as you expect, uh, we faced some issues. Uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, uh, was about, uh, was a non-flexible uh, query uh, language, not from, not like PromQL, um, because it's um, that separated uh, data string data model, and you have to use a lot of wildcard if you want to do complex aggregation. And because it's a because it's a centralized service uh, at Criteo, uh, if it's done, uh, all the alerts can't be uh, evaluated anymore uh, for the whole company. So this is an issue, and we were looking for uh, another um, solution. So here, here come uh, Prometheus. Um, Prometheus uh, is cool. Uh, PrimQL is very flexible, powerful for aggregation. Uh, label, we love labels, um, and we can decentralize uh, alert definitions. So cool, it solves our problems. But um, some of our users would like to see a time series for several months and maybe several years, um, and because we have. Um, Hundred of million of uh, time series, uh, we can uh, store them for um, a very long time uh, with Prometheus, and we need done something. And Prometheus don't do done something. So at some point, uh, we need both of them: uh, Prometheus for uh, collect data, aggregate metrics, and distribute alerting, and Graphite uh, for done something and long term storage. So we uh, look at the documentation of Prometheus, and there is a remote storage API with remote write, remote read, and uh, we fork the um, the demo in the documentation for remote write and graphite. Um, yeah, and um, we were able to uh, write um, into graphite using a default path that is just. Um, a translation using uh, all the labels, name, and values in alphabetic order. So it works, but for migration, uh, people were using graphite. Uh, there are thousands of dashboards and alerts using graphite, and so they want to customize the path, and because they want to, at some point, using both solution, both solution at the same time. So we implement the feature, and. You can match uh, your metric using uh, labels uh, to select uh, the template uh, to write in graphite. Um, yeah, that's cool. We, we, can, we can customize how we write from parameters to graphite. And now, what what, what do we do? Um, we have application a parameters that scrap it, and we re we use remote write uh, through graphite uh, to, for long term storage. But uh, if people want to graph this data. They still need to use graphite, and no, that's not a that's not a, sol a solution. So we implemented um, also uh, the remote read uh, API, so that our users only deal with Prometheus and don't see graphite anymore. And uh, here's an example um, of a Prometheus that has been started two hours ago, and we are querying uh, a time series for one year, so. You have to understand that you can't uh, query the world for for years uh, because you'll break your Prometheus. But if you do it uh, uh, with some precaution, uh, it's okay to uh, to query um, data that is not in the Prometheus anymore. So yes, and now uh, our users are just using Prometheus. And that helps some teams at Criteo to migrate from Graphite to um, the combination of uh, Prometheus and, and Graphite. Uh, here's some uh, numbers about how, how we use it. Uh, we have uh, about 100 time series in Prometheus um, and uh, only uh, 30 remote adapters that are application uh, the, between uh, the two services. And yeah, that's all. You, you can uh, 
look at uh, our Git repo. It's uh, fully open source, and yeah, it's a, a fork from the documentation of Prometheus. Thank you. So I wrote these slides like two hours ago, and obviously I've not rehearsed this, so hopefully I'll fit them in time. David dropped the bombshell this morning that we're working on logging and gave a bit of a demo. Um, there's a bit of a backstory. I actually alluded to it in a PromCon talk last year, so if you were here, you would remember that David and I started a company called Causal. We wanted to do metrics logging and tracing in a single platform, um, and then you know the kind of the Causal pitch was very much, this is your instant, res uh, instant response flow. So you start by getting an alert in Slack, <laughs> and then uh, you go to your dashboards, and then you go to the explore view. You can see we're slowly getting through this. Previously, that would have been the Prometheus UI. You customize your alert, your dashboard a little bit to really drill into what's gone wrong, and then eventually you look at the logs for the relevant service, and then maybe some traces, and you fix the bug. So this was the whole idea behind Causal. Um, one of the things I quite like, when I showed this picture, if I showed this picture last year, these were six different services, and now there's just two. You know, we're, we're slowly getting this kind of uh, workflow that we really wanted. And then this happened. Um, Raj, if he's here, uh, who's very kind enough to invite us to join Grafana Labs. Um, and they've, they've really given us a lot of support in this vision. Um, so what is the idea behind the logging stuff? Well, Prometheus's data model is lovely and simple, easy to explain. You've got a set of label values, points to a time-indexed array of uh, float64 values. So the logging idea that we're going with, we don't have a name for it yet, so we're just calling it Grafana logging, is the same. You have a set of label values, and it points to a time-indexed stream of log lines. It's, it's, that, it's basically Prometheus for logs, if you like. Um, OK, so how do you get these label values? Well, we just use Prometheus. Um, we vendored the service discovery and relabeling packages into something I'm calling Promtail. It sits on every machine as a, well, we run on Kubernetes, so it sits on every machine as a daemon set in Kubernetes. It tails the logs on the hard disk, which are written by Docker. So your job is running in a container, writing logs out to stood and stood out. Promtail's tailing those logs, sending it to Grafana logging. I'm not going to talk about the architecture for Grafana logging. I'm just going to talk about this bit for now. The, this, I literally ran this command about an hour ago to get the config map for Logish. And you'll, hopefully, if you've ever written a Prometheus config, you'll notice this is identical. I mean, it's literally the same struct. Um, so we use. Kubernetes service discovering, we, you can do relabeling. So here's the, I've, I've banged on about this a few times, I like to include the namespace in the job name. So that's the rule to do that. This is exactly the same config we load into our Prometheus server. And the reason that's important is because as they're consistent, the job has the same labels for its metrics as it does for its logs. And this is how you can switch between the two really seamlessly. David gave you a, a very quick demo this morning, so he sent me the screenshot. Um, this is not merged into master yet. Um, but yeah, so uh, I can't give you a real demo myself, but this is what it looks like. In the explore view, you can now get logs. That's it. How, many, how much time have I got? Two minutes left. Okay, two minutes left, so I'll say a few more things. We are going to open source it. We haven't open sourced it yet because the code's a bit embarrassing. But when it's a lot better, I said that last year as well. It's not a very good joke. <laughs> uh, when it gets better, it's the next thing I'm going to work on, and so expect it to be open source soon. Um, another question we commonly get is, will we support other log sources? Um, yeah, Grafana is all about supporting as many data sources as we can. So we expect this to also work you know, with different logging backends. Another question we get is, how does this compare to the Elk stack? Well, hopefully it's easier to run. Um, uh, but also, like, it's just solving a different problem. Um, this, we expect this for like your stood out and stood you know, for your container logs. This is not a general event logging system. This is not a solution to high cardinality problem. This is for seeing the stack trace that caused the error. You know, this, the idea behind this is that it's a very cost-effective place to put your logs. You, you know, it should be orders of magnitude cheaper than an Elk cluster or a Splunk cluster. I don't know. But yeah, so they're the normal questions we got. Yeah, come and find me afterwards if you've got more questions. Thank you. Great. Hello, everyone. So, like you probably already know, I'm working for Red Hat, um, upstream Prometheus. And uh, I wanted to share something with you that Marcus this morning touched a little bit on. It's the, the way you can implement your own service discovery for Prometheus. Um, so, why do we want some service discovery? Because of all the, the nice things that it brings, like mostly you don't have to reload your Prometheus server when new targets or appears or new or target disappear. 
so you, you've got some uh, monitoring system which is always up to date to what, what it needs to monitor. What we have currently supported uh, in the repo are the files, DNS console, Kubernetes, so a few uh, container orchestrators, and we have all the major cloud providers, so GCP, EC2, Azure. Um, but what, what if you're not on those platforms? Then how can you add some new service discovery? Like we discussed in the panel, that's something that, that is not going to happen. Uh, I just copied some, some pull requests that we had to close, which is really sad because people have spent some time on it and we unfortunately have to say to them, no, it's not going to happen because, because why? Because this is the current status of the repo. We have, so I filtered on the service discovery issues we have 39 open, which for a team like us is a lot. Um, and it's only for the service discovery systems that we currently support. I mean, it doesn't include new service discoveries. So what can you do now? Um, there's been a blog post on the Prometheus uh, website describing how you can do that. So shout out to Callum, who has worked on that. Uh, he's not there today. Um, but he spent a lot of time to implement a service discovery example so that you can implement your own. Um, so how does it work? It's pretty simple. Um, start from there. You've got some, we, we assume that you've got some API service that from where you can your inventory of the targets that you want to scrap. What you need to implement is this part. So you, you've got the, the talk from Marcus this morning that explained quite well how they do it for uh, at Fastly. Uh, this application is responsible for querying your API service, write a file that will be uh, understood by the Prometheus server that will read it and also, that will automatically reload the content of the file whenever you have a target appearing or disappearing from your inventory. And then it will automatically scrap uh, your targets. Um, so that's a concrete example um, of, in fact, the funny thing is that there are two projects because I spent some time to work on the, so Scaleway is a cloud provider uh, that you may know. Uh, I spent some time to just to exercise the, the example. I wanted to test it myself. And once I have finished that, I, I learned that they were working on something similar. So hopefully, we will merge the two. They will maintain the, their official SD uh, application. Uh, just to give you an example, it's 200 lines of code, uh, nothing fancy, really simple to implement. So that if people have have IDs for other service discovery, they can look at that code and just copy and adapt to their needs. Uh, a few things to, to think about uh, when you implement your own service discovery is just look after how you are going to handle the targets that are deleted from your inventory. Um, it's best to instrument also the, the SD application uh, just because we monitor everything. And uh, you can then, after that, add yourself to the Prometheus documentation so that other users can f easily find uh, your application and so you can share with the community. That's it. Unfortunately, I'm not able to connect to the screen. Yeah, by the time he fixes. Hi, I'm Ganesh. I am from IIT Hyderabad in India. So I did my GSOC with Prometheus uh, this summer and uh, Gautam was my official mentor, but mostly uh, reviewed by Brian. Uh, so in this GSOC, I added two features and fixed a bug. Two of those features are still under review. One of them, uh, yeah, before I would talk about the features, uh, many of you might have written uh, many alerting rules. So how many of you wanted to uh, wondered uh, what's the best for duration for your alerts. 
Anyone? Yeah. So I just uh, fix that, not exactly fix, I created a UI where you can put your alerting rules and test your rules uh, uh, on the current data that you have. Unfortunately, I cannot show the demo right now. So the demo just consisted uh, writing a rule and executing on the present data. It will show all the alerts that you have. And you can check it for all the past data and not just the current data. And about the second uh, feature, uh, uh, many of you, I believe many of you want to test your alerting rules or the recording rules once before you put it into production. Is there anyone who wants to do that? Basically, I'm talking about unit testing. So, yeah. Thanks, Gautam. Yeah, uh, this is about the UI, the first one that I talked about. Uh, so you just enter your alerting rule here and then execute. And you get, yeah, the rule is just instance down of for five minutes and 10 minutes. So from this graph, you won't get much insight in the view, you have the description and the labels, the graph of the expression and the graph of the alert. Uh, this is created uh, when you press execute, so it's not stored. Yeah, so this is an insight in the UI and it also checks for any mistakes that you make, for example, templating variables. Yeah, so the next one is unit testing. So in the unit testing, you give the input that you want and just tell at this time for this alerting rule, what should have in your alerts. And you can also test your uh, PromQL expressions. It's as simple as running prompt tool, test rules, and done. If it's a success, then you get a success. Or as you would expect, I'll do some mistake in this. Like making this six and making this nine. And yeah, you get an alert, error. Yeah. So these two features are still under review. And the third bug fix with which I added another bug apparently. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, Brian just told me about it yesterday so it crashes Prometheus. That was pers <laughs> per persisting for state across uh, uh, restarts. So just uh, imagine you have a for duration of 12 hours and the alert is pending for 11 hours and your Prometheus crashes. But when you restart the Prometheus, you will have to wait for another 12 hours so that the alert will fire. So I just fixed that. So when the Prometheus restarts, the for state, the for duration, uh, the for state of the alert is restored and you have to wait for just one more hour. And apparently that crashes right now. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a brief overview of what I did in the GSO. Yeah, thank you. Of course, my last talk, which would have been the last talk yesterday, instead of the last talk today, is evaluating Prometheus knowledge in interviews. Now, you might not know who I am. I am one of the Prometheus developers. I wrote a book on Prometheus. I'm an author of a blog. You might have heard of you, you might not. So two years ago, so who was at PromCon 2016 in Berlin? A few handfuls. You remember my talk uh, about implementing Conway's life in Prometheus. And last year, who was here as well? More hands. I uh, gave a, a talk on row 110 in Prometheus. And who was here then in 2018, in Berlin? No, there was only like 10 of us. The real PromCon, PromCon zero. Anyway, so as Prometheus grows, we can see the growth in the conference with like 300 people on the waiting list. Uh, you know, you might be looking for someone to come in and join your team who already has some Prometheus experience. And basically, how do you get someone who you know actually knows something about Prometheus? Now, you could look at their CV and look at their experience with Prometheus. So, for example, are they a Prometheus follower? Have they written a book? Do they have a well-known blog? <laughs> <laughs> have they demonstrated esoteric PromQL knowledge? Uh, well, let's be honest, Prometheus is fairly new. You know, no one can possibly have 10 plus years of Prometheus knowledge after all. It's only been out for five. 
So what you kind of want here, it turns out, is a low-pass filter, right? Because you don't want to be looking for a unicorn, someone who cannot possibly exist, or whose rates are just too high anyway. Uh, but there is a thing that maybe you just want to save yourself time, and rather than talking to every single person who applies and can spell Prometheus, and, you know, the sequel to Alien, and uh, maybe we want some simple tests you can do to just throw away the ones who are obviously faking it until they make it. Um, and this is where I'm going to bring in FizzBuzz. Now, if you don't know FizzBuzz, it's an example. I was on Coding Horror, I first came across this one, uh, or maybe Hacker News. It's a very, very simple programming problem uh, that should be no problem for someone who can code, like, at all. Uh, because what you do is you count up from 1 to 100. If the number's a multiple of 3, you print Fizz. If it's a multiple of 5, you print Buzz. And if it's Vote, you print FizzBuzz. That's the entire thing. If you go at C2, which is the original wiki, uh, you can see lots of different uh, examples for that. So this is a pretty simple programming problem. And this is a common example of, well, a FizzBuzz test, which is a low-pass filter, because a surprising amount of supposed, supposed programmers apparently can't do this. So we can take this tool, which has been developed outside Prometheus, and use it for Prometheus. Because we can use this to evaluate PromQL knowledge and get an idea, like, you know, you should be able to do basic PromQL, right? So if it's easy in any programming language, it should be easy in PromQL. So let's do it. Uh, so obviously, anyone here should be able to do it, but I'm going to share my solution. <laughs> so firstly, we would like some input data. Uh, now, obviously, we can't have multiple things with the same value, so we just need something with like number equals 1 due to strings and so on. So that's number equals 1, 10, 11, 12, 13, because that's how it's sorted. And we can build that up with a recording rule. Uh, this should be reasonably obvious how this works. And from there, we need to filter based on the values. The good news is PromQL has a modulus operator, and it has label to replace, which can do string stuff. So this isn't actually that hard. So all we need to do is basically, if it's modulus 15, which is 3 and 5, we put in fizzbuzz. 5 is buzz, 3 is fizz, and otherwise we just put the number into the output label. This will produce something like this. So it's like fizz buzz, fizz buzz, fizz buzz, fizz buzz, fizz buzz, 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 because it's sorting alphabetically. Or sorting some way, I forget how we sort that. So the answers are right, just in the wrong order. So what we can do is we can basically squash that number and put in the original input number using a group left, and then we can just sort it, and we also need to filter out the zero from the input. And then that produces as you would expect, one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, 7, 8, fizz, buzz, 11, fizz, 13, 14, fizz, buzz, after proof there's a fizz, buzz, 16, and it goes on up to 100. And just to show you that I'm not entirely making things up, here are the rules I just showed you. Okay, and also you notice this feature. It's very handy. Uh, here's my input data as I showed you. I need to re-execute this. It takes 100 seconds to start filling it all out. And here, lo and behold, is the output data. It just, oh, I forgot to put the sort around it. There we go. There we are. Fizz buzz all the way up to 100. And I now hope I have demonstrated at least that I have the extremely basic PromQL knowledge that would you willing to consider me for a... Uh, basic Prometheus role. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yanara. I am an assistant engineer in Latam Airlines for around four years. And today, I will talk about uh, Prometheus as code. A little context, uh, Latam Airlines is a big company in Latin America that's selling millions of dollars per flight for day. So to introduce the use of Prometheus, I would like to concentrate in four principal focus. Uh, we have an important number of employees in LATAM Digital. We have a large infrastructure for the site LATAM.com. We know that the, all the products in LATAM Digital have the requirement to monitor in our, our system, and a critical factor only had three depths for maintaining and improving monitoring tools. Taking this in mind, we need to find some way to automate all the configuration for Prometheus. And my third option, option was configuration management. Um, how can I start implementing uh, Prometheus with 
chef has told of, um, of configuration management, first, we need to permit you some graphic infrastructure. Developers write all the code required, all the code required to enable the co base configuration for Prometheus and Grafana infrastructure, and then upload it to a chef server. Now, all the chef client identify all the configuration that should be executed according to their role, role list. For example, we have a group of configuration like uh, install Prometheus servers, install Prometheus database, install ARM manager that are associate to Prometheus ARM infrastructure. And the same thing for Grafana. Now, we have ready the infrastructure, but we need metrics. Prometheus need metrics. And for this, developers need to break exporter. Uh, chef developer create the exporter, upload it to a chef server, and then we need to install all the exporter into any kind of server that you want to enable a, a service, for example. Into Apache server, I enable Apache exporter to enable metrics of Apache. And into a Docker server, I enable C advisor for enable metrics of containers. At this point, we have infra infrastructure, we have exported, but permit us need to know where the metrics are and go there to consume them. For this, we create a configuration that auto discover all the endpoints that are exposed in metrics. And how, can it, how it works? Uh, we create an all library that find all the servers that are that have an exporter, including then in, including a run list, including an exporter into the run list. Uh, according to this query that you can see, and the an abort that are exposed in metrics. Having this, having this. Prometheus can use this information to autofill all the configuration files, and with this, have all the metrics available. As you can see, you can do different things with Chef and Prometheus. And with this schema, you only need to control exporters and the other things Prometheus you will do magically. Finally, uh, if you want to break code, you need to implement best practice, like a, a version control, code review. You can use Jenkins to continuous integration and ensure that your code works well. And also, you can use Jenkins to continuous deployment and deploy to production as early as possible. That is all. Thank you so much. I leave some examples in my GitHub, and thank you. Uh, so we are using Prometheus to monitor uh, SNMP uh, switches, and some of them take like 60 seconds to like be scraped, and we scrape them like every five minutes, which means that between uh, each one of the switches, uh, it's very hard to say, okay, we monitor all of them at the same time, which is a problem for the recording rules, because like uh, we would like to have a way to uh, be able to do the recording rules just after we scrape one of the one of the targets. Like you have a switch, then you calculate the rate over the last five minutes. So I've just sent a mail to the Prometheus mailing list with like a proposal so that if other people have the same problem or like if you have some recording rules that are too big to be one at the same time and you would like to like spread them over each target that you scrape, then you are welcome to join the conversation so that we can think about how we can do that and uh, discuss about my proposition. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I saw that there was extra time for Atlantis. So I thought I will re, uh, give this talk again. I gave this talk in 2013 in the Debian conference uh, just after starting being a freelancer. Um, and so this is about telling my story and encouraging other people to do the same. So these were my observations. Um, many of the people here are very talented but maybe they're not completely happy with the jobs they're doing or um, for different reasons. Uh, some, sometimes it's because not the right project or just because they don't like working nine to five for many different reasons. But those skills are in very high demands. You can see how much swag companies offer to keep you around. Uh, as you might have noticed in this lovely office, I used to work uh, in Google. Um, 
and companies do take advantage of this. Uh, and also, that something very common in our community uh, that people don't have a great confidence and uh, we are not great negotiators. So, in this way, they, they manage to keep the conditions as they wanted. So, my story is that I like to travel loads. Um, I cannot stay in the same place for long. I have had great jobs, but as much vacation days as I had, they were never enough. Uh, not even the great five weeks I was getting in Ireland. Um, and I, at some point, I, I managed to get semi-remote work when I was working, but then I had to leave that because I went to, to Google, and then I couldn't do remote work there. And yeah, I was earning loads of money. Um, the company was great, the projects were great. But what I wanted to do was something else. I wanted to travel, I wanted to have freedom. Um, so I thought, there are so many companies that need this. Um, not every company needs a full-timer. Not every company can afford a full-timer with a lot of experience. Um, they're willing to pay for it. And if I be learn to negotiate a bit better, I can set my own conditions. <clears throat> so yeah, it says that I quit my job two and a half months ago. That was 2013. <laughs> <laughs> Five years later, I'm still doing this. Uh, at that point, I had one customer that didn't last long. <laughs> I can tell you the first six months, nine months were difficult. It's, not, it's never easy at the beginning. Uh, it's scary, uh, but with patience and networking and doing things here and there to, to make yourself known, I got more and more customers and I get a regular stream of projects, enough for, to wear my... Uh, it, it, it's still working, yeah? <laughs> um, I work from home, but home is whatever my laptop is. My office is this computer I have here. I don't have anything else. And so in these past five years, I lived in different cities um, three months at a time because I'm still an immigrant, so I can stay more than that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'll have to stay longer. Um, and yeah. Uh, I charge more, I charge good rates, uh, but I'm still trying to get rich. I, I work 10 hours a week, 15, sometimes 20. <laughs> but that's really stretching it. <laughs> um, that, ends, that lets me do other things, like I've been contributing loads to Debian. I've been able to do all the, the work for the packages uh, in Prometheus because I had plenty of free time. Otherwise, I had not been able to do that while working 9 to 5. And another thing that's great, I'm a huge procrastinator. And many people feel, uh, feel the same, I guess. And when you're being paid to work nine to five and you're doing nothing because you cannot concentrate or because you cannot overcome your procrastination, you feel guilty, you stay long hours or trying to compensate. Many times I will just spend the whole night working to compensate for a week of not doing anything. Um, now I do something else. I just stop the timer do something else, and I don't feel guilty. It's great. <laughs> like, really. I never, I never managed to fix my procrastination, but at least I don't feel bad about it now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's my story. I've been doing this for five years. Uh, yeah, five and a half years now. Um, I think er everybody can do it, at least in our profession. And the more people does it, there's going to be more demand. <laughs> so everybody wins. And that's why I say this is hacking capitalism for fun and profit. Thank you. <laughs>